Violence, death, looting, raiding, and complete and utter chaos. That was a scene in Newark from July 12th to the 17th, 1967. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? A fester like a soul? And then run. Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a silky sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? It was a dark and ugly scene, a scene that had been building for many, many years. Since the end of the war, many African Americans had been slowly becoming less and less enthralled with the limited opportunities available to them in Newark. Once the GIs came back, many African Americans were forced to transition from a time of abundant jobs and wealth to an era plagued by unemployment and blatant racism. Newark had been experiencing a decade of growth and expansion during World War II, but this growth was without cost. There had been an influx of African Americans into the city to fulfill the new wartime jobs. In 1950, according to the U.S. Census, there were approximately 75,000 Negroes in Newark, comprising somewhat over 70% of the city's total population. In 1960, federal census takers found that 138,035 persons, or 34% of the city's population, were Negro. The U.S. government was pumping money into the city of Newark. With its airport and convenient location on the Passaic River, Newark was in an extremely advantageous position to produce and manufacture war materials for the U.S. Army. Shipyards became a staple in Newark. Working in a shipyard was also one of the most desirable jobs in the entire city. Because of government subsidies, the shipyards paid the highest wages and offered work to all, regardless of race. This led to an increase of the African-American working class. They were making considerable amounts of money, and were able to interact with society like never before. This, albeit a brief period of economic prosperity, was the very opportunity that many African Americans had so deeply desired. It represented hope and the chance at a new life. The sudden increase in high-paying jobs led many African Americans to move into Newark and find housing within the city. They didn't have equal access to homes, but the homes they did have access to were affordable and available thanks to their new jobs. This increase in African American residents, however, did not go unnoticed by the white residents living in the community of Newark. The increase in the African American population was also coupled with a decrease in the white population. This era was the start of the white flight to the suburbs. The white flight, however, did not create an increase in the housing market. Many renters still clung to old prejudices and showed blatant racism to many African Americans who would try and rent houses in certain areas. African Americans were confined to the center of the city. This downtown area offered large, multifamily units that were often blighted from years of use and poor upkeep. Everywhere, there was the same inequality with regard to education, job opportunities, income, and housing. In each of the ghettos, the Negro felt himself surrounded by an intrinsic wall of whites. Due to their limited housing options, Blacks in Newark paid more for lesser quality homes. Public housing in Newark merely helped concentrate poverty and despair in one centralized location, further isolating the black poor from society at large. Newark was running headfirst into a severe housing crisis. The city as a whole had an incredibly low amount of housing available to its incredibly fast growing population, and people were starting to get angry. The situation was creating areas around the city that were extremely crowded. In 1930, the African-American population in Newark was only 39,000, or 8.9% of the total population. Compare this number with the 1960 figure of 138,000, or 34% of the city's population, and the increase of African-American residents in the city becomes much more clear. Negroes were underrepresented on the local government. In six New Jersey communities with sizable Negro populations, of a total of 50 councilmen, six were Negro. The end of the war brought a sweeping wind of change to the city of Newark. 
the return of war veterans, the creation of the GI Bill, and the top-down initiative to renovate and redevelop the blighted areas that existed within many cities took Newark from a city on the rise to a city on the verge of crisis. Unfortunately for many African Americans, these changes presented a whole new set of problems. Veterans and their families were looking for stable jobs, housing, and a calm, safe environment to raise their families. This, of course, was a problem because now that the war was over, all the jobs created by the war were now gone. This left thousands out of work, and with the returning veterans needing both housing and jobs, many African Americans were turned down for jobs, loans, and housing opportunities in favor of their white counterparts. In the Newark survey, 29.7% of self-reported riders were unemployed, as opposed to the only 19% unemployment rate among the non-involved. It was during this time that the seeds of the riot were really planted. Racism was becoming more and more prevalent. City planning boards began to conduct inspections of different areas throughout the city and effectively decreed that almost all primarily African American neighborhoods were blighted, substandard, and in need of repair. They targeted these areas as places in need of urban renewal, which within the families that were living in the areas at the time would have to be moved. Blight was judged by the city planning committee. During this time, blighted areas were so often associated with African American families that the term Negro removal was used when talking about urban renewal in Newark. In Newark, since 1959, more than 12,000 African American families, mostly low income, had been displaced by such public uses as urban renewal, public housing, and highways. The heart of urban renewal was focused in the city center, primarily the central ward. This was also the location of one of the largest African American communities in the entire city. The increasing pressure from the local government to tear down and redevelop the area were often met with conflict. The residents at the Central Ward felt a strong sense of disillusionment and were unhappy with the blatant attempts to destroy their homes and displace the thousands of families that lived in the area. The growing displeasure in the area finally boiled over on July 12, 1967. The arrest of a cab driver and the police brutality that followed sparked the largest riot in New Jersey history. It started in the Central Ward and spread throughout downtown Newark area, creating a scene of panic and violence that left 23 dead, 700 injured, and more than $10 million in damage after the six-day riot. In the eyes of the local government, Newark had become a city in decline with a serious downtown problem. The local government interest in completely rebuilding Newark and removing the ugly rundown areas that had been created from 1930 to 1945. This almost two decade period that consisted of the Great Depression and World War II led to a gradual degradation and abandoning of the downtown area. Since early 1950, NHA officials had been convinced that there was no mere project would be safe from slum encroachment in the Central Ward. Only a full-scale demolition of the ghetto or total neighborhood redevelopment would suffice in that area. The NHA did not abandon its plan for a second public housing project in the Central Ward renewal area. They relocated 2,400 families displaced by Mercer Street clearance, 91% of whom were Negro, and showed their commitment to the same policies they had used in the Spruce Street project. In Newark, municipal and state authorities continued to pursue a medical center project designed to occupy up to 150 acres in the almost all-Negro Central Ward. The project, which was bitterly opposed by Negroes before the riot, would have required massive relocation of Negroes and was a source of great tension in the Negro community. Unfortunately for the city of Newark, the residents of these blighted areas didn't see the blight. They saw prejudice and unfair treatment, and eventually they had had enough. The riot of 1967 can be described as the result of years of racism, unequal treatment, lack of both housing and jobs, and most importantly, urban renewal. When looking back on the events that led to the riot, it really seems like Newark was a matter of when, not why. The racial tensions, loss of hope, and general sense of disillusionment was evident in the African American population. And unfortunately, it all boiled over in the form of a riot, a riot that Newark has never really recovered from. Virtually every major episode of urban violence in the summer of 1967 was foreshadowed by an accumulation of unresolved grievances by ghetto residents against local authorities. 
coinciding with this high level of dissatisfaction, confidence in the willingness and ability of local government to respond to Negro grievances was low. The city of Newark fell victim to racism, violence, and decay. The once promising city is now considered by many to be a slum. And although there have been various developments in the downtown area, the city has never quite recovered. Even today, we can plainly see the lasting impact of the riot and the racial tension that urban renewal created. Once a city on the hill known for its industry and strong workforce, the city is now little more than a rundown city that happens to have an airport. Newark is a perfect case study of government overreach and urban renewal gone awry.